Hi guys and welcome back to another True Crime and Makeup Time video. If you're new here, my name is Sara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, come back weekly. Check me out. Also, if you guys have any great case suggestions, leave them in the comments down below. I do read every single one and I write them down and I check them out. So if that's your thing, definitely leave me some suggestions down below. Now, today's case is one that hooked me years ago. Before OJ's trial became like the extravaganza that it was, it was Pamela Smart's trial that was actually the first murder trial that was broadcast in the US like history. It was a steamy tale of blood and lust. The trial became like an international sensation. So much so that daytime soap operas were replaced by this trial being aired on TV. People wanted to hear more about sexual obsession and betrayal than watch their you know, telenovelas. So let's get into today's case and talk about Pamela Smart. Now, Pamela Smart was actually born Pamela Ann Warhas on August 16th, 1967 in Coral Gables, Florida. She is the second of three children. She has an older sister named Elizabeth and she has a brother, John, who is three years younger than her. Her father worked as a commercial airline pilot and her mother worked as a legal secretary. And when she was in elementary school, she actually moved to New Hampshire and went to high school in Pinkerton Academy. And she was actually a cheerleader in high school. After high school, she went to college at Florida State University and she graduated with honors in a uh, communications degree. And now during this time, Pamela, like, you know, as a youngin, she loved heavy metal. Like that was her thing. So during her college uh, days, she combined her passion for heavy metal together with her career goals and ended up hosting a uh, radio show weekly. She only hosted it uh, one night a week and it was called Metal Madness and her alias was Maiden of Metal. So she loved heavy metal. Now, Pamela met a man named Gregory Smart in 1986 back at home in New Hampshire when she was actually on a break from college um, for the Christmas break. She met him at a New Year's Eve party and she was a student at the time. And Greg, he had like long hair, he was handsome, and he too loved heavy metal. And this all sounds so lame, but I mean, that's how you fall in love, right? You guys have like combined interests and, you know, especially music, like that's a huge thing to me. You have to like the same music as me. <laughs> And Greg was super popular, especially with the ladies. And he came across to Pamela as a bit of a rebel. He was very confident and Pamela really liked this about him. The two of them, they quickly started dating and they even moved in together like very quickly. Pamela actually moved permanently to Florida so she could live with him during her senior year. When she graduated, the two of them, they moved back to New Hampshire and Greg, he gave uh, Pamela a puppy, which she named Halen. And this name came after her, you know, one of her favorite bands, Van Halen. Now, like I said, Greg was super popular. He was super confident and he loved to go on dates. But when he met Pam, like things were just different. He just fell in love super quickly. He seemed to be very serious about Pamela and he was willing to give up, you know, his, his cool ways and his party lifestyle to be with her. So when Greg asked Pamela to marry him, everyone was shocked. They were just like, whoa, he's willing to like settle down. But keeping in mind, they were still so young. They were only in their early 20s and they both got married in 1989. So once they got married, they moved into a nice little home. They had this nice little dog and everything seemed to be going really well for them. They were a young couple, newlyweds, living their life. Pamela took a job as a media coordinator at Winnicunit High School and she was happy working there, but things already weren't going so well for the couple pretty much as soon as they got married because married life didn't really suit Pamela. She, you know, she was like a rocker chick. She wasn't into that kind of like lifestyle or what married life was turning out to be like. Her rocker husband, Greg, you know, he had to go get like a real job now and he had to cut off his hair, his long hair, as part of like his work conditions. He had to wear a suit and a tie and be super proper and clean cut 
to work at his father's insurance company. Pamela was not into it. She didn't like this change in Greg because one of the things that she loved about him was his long hair. She wanted, you know, cool Greg back. Now, on the surface, they seemed to be the most perfect couple, but then cracks were beginning to form in their marriage. They both began to want different things. Pamela, she wanted to just, you know, live it up, party, do her own thing. But Greg, he wanted to settle down now. He wanted a family. He wanted kids. He was ready for that. And to be fair, like, that was normal back then, you know, to do it in your early your early 20s. It wasn't such a crazy thought. Pamela wanted to also work in TV as a television reporter. And then soon into their marriage, Pamela accuses Greg of cheating on her, like within the first couple of years. And soon enough, Pamela alleges that Greg cheated on her just a couple months into their marriage. So one night, Greg, he didn't come home and she stayed up all night waiting for him to come back. And when he finally came back, she confronts him about where he's been. Greg finally then confessed that yes, he had actually been out all night with one woman. He, you know, was cheating on Pamela. And this really, really affected Pamela because she was like, we've literally like been together like two seconds. She says that, you know, he cheated on her so early into the marriage. It was, it was hard to, it was hard for her to come to terms with because she was like, is something wrong with me? Like, we've literally been together two seconds and you're already cheating on me. You're sick of me. You're over me. Like, what is, what is wrong with me that you don't want to be with me? She began questioning herself saying, you know, maybe I'm not good enough for him. Maybe, maybe I'm not the woman that I thought I was. So they sat down and they talked this through and they decided like, look, we're not ready to give up on this marriage. Let's give it another chance and try to make it work. Now, Pamela obviously agreed to this, but deep down she couldn't get over it. And I don't think I could get over it. She, um, she couldn't like truly forgive him. She couldn't move on. And she felt deeply betrayed. And I would too. So she got this job at the high school when she was 22 years old. And as part of her job, she also volunteered in this program, which would keep kids from doing drugs. The program was called Project Self-Esteem. And it was basically trying to teach them like, you know, you don't have to give into peer pressure and you need to just be strong and be who you are. Like basically trying to, because drugs back then were a big deal. You know, kids were starting to do them a lot more. So through this volunteer program, she meets a man by the name of Billy Flynn. Okay, scrap that. She meets a boy. He's a boy. He's 15 years old. He's a student. His name is Billy Flynn. Billy was six years younger than her and... I mean, you guys know where this is going. He would always compliment her. He would always flatter her, tell her she looked so good that day. She was so beautiful. Pamela, she said she started to just get super flattered and like started to develop feelings for Billy. And she also believes that he had feelings for her as well. Now, there have been conflicting accounts as to who seduced whom, but both Billy and Pamela state that they were indeed lovers. They began having sex with each other around the time of Billy's 16th birthday and Pamela slept with Billy five more times over the course of two months. She says she believes that this happened because she couldn't get the thought of Greg cheating on her out of her mind and this was a way for Pamela to, you know, get her self-esteem back to make her feel good about, I mean, project self-esteem, right? So to make her feel sort of good about herself again. Pamela states she was bored. She, you know, was feeling unattractive and neglected by Greg. She also states that, you know, Greg had gone from being wild and crazy and her, you know, like metal, heavy metal boyfriend to this serious, like businessman. He was too mature. He was like career focused and Pamela was still young. She, I mean, she was 22. She was basically still a child. She wanted to have fun. She craved excitement in her life. So like I said, Pamela, you know, she was only 22 and she was quite an attractive woman. Like I would have to say so. And a lot of the boys at the school, you know, like most young kids with a decently young, attractive teacher found her super attractive and would always like, you know, kind of hit on her. And a lot of them had a crush on her, including Billy. Billy was one of these boys. And boys and girls having crushes on their teachers, like that's such a normal thing. But what happened between Pamela and Billy was not normal. Now, Billy was a quiet very young boy. 
He had long hair, and guess what, guys? He loved heavy metal. He also played the guitar, and this was something that drew Pamela in because it basically reminded her of what Greg was like when he was younger, you know? Like, now one has to wonder, did Pamela have that much low self-esteem at the time like for her to do this she's in a boring marriage at a super young age her husband cheated on her and now she's like getting attention from this like decently attractive young boy i mean he was way too young for her but it's almost like she was getting addicted to the attention he was giving her she was 22 years old but she was probably feeling like oh my god my life is just kind of like so boring and he made her feel young and attractive and excited again at this point pam was loving it she was loving all of it all the attention so i mean in terms of billy in his horny young 15 year old mind i mean why not right for him he doesn't know there is absolutely no logic in his mind he's 15 he's a child and i mean yes he does know what he's doing but does he really you know does he truly understand what's going on? Billy also had a tough upbringing. His parents always fought and his mother actually took him away from New Hampshire to uh, California at one point, away from his dad. And then his dad, you know, passed away when he was away um, in a car accident. So that was something for sure that he would have been like, struggling to deal with and maybe this was a distraction for Billy. So Billy and Pamela's first sexual encounter took place when Pamela actually invited Billy and another student of theirs to Pamela's house. The other friend, her name was Cecilia Pierce, and she invited Billy and Cecilia over to her house to watch a movie. Now the movie was called um, Nine and a Half Weeks, and apparently this is a very sexual movie. I haven't seen this. And it stars Kim Basinger and uh, Mickey Rourke. And obviously Greg wasn't there when um, these students came over to the house. He was away on a business trip. So during this movie night, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, but Pamela, she tells Cecilia, this girl, um, can you just go take my dog for a walk? Like, um, I know you're here to watch this movie, but my dog really needs to go for a walk. So see you later, Cecilia. And Cecilia goes and takes this dog for a walk. And once Cecilia has gone, Pam then initiates sex with Billy. Like how awkward would that have been? Like, hey girl, um, you know, we're here to watch this movie, but my dog, like he's like, his legs need a walk. So can you just go take him? It's just so weird. And I mean, obviously I feel Cecilia knew what was going on and she just did it because that's her teacher, right? And sending Cecilia to go take a walk while Billy stays in the home. Like, obviously that's so awkward and so weird, but whatever, Cecilia did it. Cecilia actually played a big role because she became Pam's assistant and she would run like all the mundane tasks and things like that for Pam. And because of this, she would share very intimate details with Pam about Pam's escapades, let's say. I mean, Pam would share everything with Cecilia, like intimate details, her thoughts, plans, you know, for the weekend. Very dumb, but also good in a way. So for the next two months, Pamela and Billy had a full-blown affair and they had sex whenever they could in her car, in her house, even at school. Every time Greg is away, she'd call Billy over. She would even have sex with Billy in his own bedroom while his mother was downstairs. Like, that's ballsy. <sighs> Billy was infatuated with Pamela. He thought she was the most amazing woman and he would do anything for her. So on May 1st, 1990, it was a normal day and Pamela is saying goodbye to Greg. He's on his way to work. And this was like six days before their first wedding anniversary. Greg normally left for work at around 9.45 a.m. So she says goodbye to him. Pamela also left for work soon after and she actually tells Greg like, Oh, I'm going to be home a bit late tonight because I have like a meeting at school that I need to attend. So they both go to work. They both have their days at work. Pamela returns home at about 10 p.m. from this school meeting. And when she got home, the house was super dark, which was strange to Pam because Greg always, like Greg's car was in the driveway and he always left the porch light on whenever he was home. But Pamela doesn't really think anything of it and she enters the home, she turns on the lights and then she finds her husband Greg 
lying dead there on the ground in front of her. He was in a puddle of blood on the floor and Pamela then screams and runs to a neighbor's house for help. Greg was only 24 years old. Now Pam is hysterical. Greg had died um, from a single gunshot wound to the head and it was clear this was an execution. And the house also looked like it had been robbed. The police arrived and they say that Pam was hysterical, but then, you know, she was pretty happy to answer questions, which they found a bit odd. And the reason why they found this odd is, I mean, her husband has just been found dead and she is happy to like talk to the police and most people aren't, you know, they want to be with their, their loved ones. Now at the um, station, Pam was insisting that Greg's death had been a robbery that had gone wrong. The police couldn't quite put their finger on it because they were like, this is so strange for a robbery to take place in this neighborhood. And then at the time that it took place, like it's a pretty busy neighborhood. Like people would have heard something. It was quite early in the night. You know, normally burglaries happen early in the morning, like when everyone's sleeping and not like in the middle of like dinner time, you know? So as the investigation proceeded, Pam was like in a frenzied state and she would alternate between depression and then like psychotic breaks. So her mother wanted to take her to get some help. So she took her to a residential mental health facility and the facility was like just about to admit Pamela when her mother hesitated and was like, no. Her mother, you know, didn't want to leave her in this hospital by herself. She's like, I can take better care of Pam by myself. And that's what she chose to do. Just hours after Greg's death, Pam was giving interviews about his death to anyone that would listen. And the police were pretty pissed off by this because they're like, don't give out all the information about the crime. Like we're trying to like catch his killer, like keep your mouth shut. So what they ended up doing was um, withholding information from Pam and not actually telling her like the forensic details and things like that because she would just blurt it out. She literally just kept talking to the press and the police were so annoyed by this. Journalists later recall saying that Pam would always greet them with her hair and makeup done. She had like perfect clothes on and she wouldn't even suggest to them like, hey, take some pictures of me like the widow with some of my wedding gifts because it makes it look like sadder for the story because, you know, these are my wedding gifts and my husband's now dead. And it was obviously very strange for the police and it was like Pamela was loving the attention she was getting, you know, and she was. She finally felt like a celebrity, you know, even though through gruesome cir circumstances, but she was finally getting the attention that she craved for so long, the attention that Greg never gave her. Now, Pamela and her relatives actually said that Pamela at the time was on a super high dose of antidepressants and sedatives. And that's why her behavior was like that. She wasn't in full control of what she was doing. And Pamela has stated, I had nothing to hide. So like, what's wrong with me just being how I'm being? Now, police at this stage, they were trying their best to figure out what had happened to Greg, what happened that night. And they had been doing so for weeks until finally a breakthrough came through. The following month, I believe it was in July, the case blew wide open when there was some rumors going around at Pamela's place of work, the high school. Two of Billy Flynn's friends had told a classmate that they had been involved in the murder of Greg. A parent of one of Billy's friends, um, the friend's name was JR and it was JR's dad that called the police. He informed them that he was concerned that his son may have been involved in a murder. Now, the reason why he believed in this is because he believed that his gun was used to kill Greg Smart. Now, JR's dad had used this gun um, prior to Greg's murder, but after he used it, he never cleaned the gun. Then when he looked at the gun recently, he realized, hold on, it's been like completely wiped clean. The gun's been cleaned. This looks so fishy. And then this is what raised his suspicions that dang, was my son using this gun for something or, you know, were one of his friends using it? And I'm sure that um, through Pamela's, you know, blabbing, they found out the type of bullet or something that was used on Greg. So JR's dad was like, well, this seems similar to my gun. So Billy, along with his three friends, um, Patrick, Pete, Randall, Vance, JR, Latimer Jr., 
Raymond Fowler and then that girl, Cecilia, they were all brought in for questioning. And it was during this questioning that the affair of Billy and Pamela came out and all five of them agreed to turn themselves in in exchange for reduced sentences. Their story was that JR, he bought bullets for his dad's gun with the money that Pamela gave him. Billy said he shot Gregory in the head while Pete held a knife to his throat. Also, Pete did this because he apparently had goals of becoming a hitman. So this was just work experience for him, right? After being told that they were going to be charged as adults, the boys then started to implicate Pam like she was involved in this crime down to the smallest detail. They said that Pam was the one who left the house door unlocked so that the boys could surprise her husband, Greg, when he got home from work. She told them to make it look like a burglary had gone wrong, that they tried to rob the house and in the process of doing so, Greg returned home and that's why they had to kill him. And she offered to pay them $500 each to commit this crime. And Greg supposedly had a $140,000 life insurance policy and that's where the money was going to come from. That's how she was going to pay everyone. Now, police were already suspicious of Pamela after her husband's death about how strange she was acting. But what they needed was a confession from Pamela. So they worked with Cecilia, her assistant, to get this confession. And the way they were going to do this was to trick Pam into a confession. So they arranged for Cecilia to wear a wire when she was going to be talking to Pam so that they could get this on record. But the recording of this conversation, there was like a problem with some of the wiring or something like that, but they could only get like partial um, bits extracted. But whatever they got was enough for the police to implicate Pam in the murder of her husband, Greg. Now I listened to the recording and in this recording, it's pretty obvious that she's involved in Greg's murder. She's talking about the, you know, murder with Cecilia so casually. She says, you know, I'm worried one day you're going to come to me and you're going to be wired up, which she obviously was at the time of the recording. And then at one point during the conversations, Pam is heard telling Cecilia, if you tell the fucking truth, you're going to be implicated in murder. She goes on to say, what good is it going to do, you know, to send me to the fucking slammer? She's kind of basically threatening Cecilia in a way, like not to say anything. But I mean, damn, like in the recording, Cecilia like doesn't even seem to flinch like Pam. Unless, I mean, we don't have a video recording, but it seems like Pam is not suspicious of her at all. Shortly after this, on 1st August 1990, the police, they race on over to Winnicott High School where Pam was working and, you know, they want to speak to her. They confront her and they say, the officer says to Pam, he says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is we know who killed Greg. And the bad news is you're under arrest. So the argument is that Pam, she was unhappy in her marriage to Greg, but she knew that a divorce was not going to be good for her, that Greg would take everything, including their dog. And it is believed that this was the motive for why Pam wanted Greg gone. Billy was completely under Pam's spell and it's believed or he stated that she began telling him that Greg was super abusive to her and she would tell Billy, you know, I really want to be with you, Billy, but I can't divorce Greg. Like if I leave him, my life's going to be ruined. He's going to take everything. And then she allegedly told Billy, if you don't find a way to get rid of Greg, I will stop having sex with you. I mean, for a young boy, sex is everything. The relationship ending, you know, the relationship ending meant that the sex would end too. No young boy wants that to end. So obviously Pamela was now confronted and in her version of events, she says that she told Billy the opposite. She said that she wanted to focus on her marriage and that, you know, she wanted to end the affair. Then she said that this is what prompted Billy to do what he did and because he was left angry that she was ending things. Pam says that none of the things that the kids are claiming took place, like she bought the bullets and, I mean, she gave the money and she told them to buy the bullets and make it look like a robbery, things like that. She says none of that happened, but that it's possible that whatever she told 
Billy that he interpreted it as to go and kill Greg. So it was all a big miscommunication. She says, you know, I told him I can't do this. You know, I have a husband. I can't carry on with this relationship. And he took it as, well, as long as Greg is around, then we can't be together. That that was in um, Billy's mind that as long as Greg was alive, Billy couldn't have Pamela. Pam said that the conversations that were taped with Cecilia were not real that she was putting on an act because she was carrying out her own private investigation of what happened to Greg and that's why she was behaving that way in the tapes. Strangely a friend of Greg's actually corroborated that part of P Pamela's like statement saying yeah she actually was conducting like a separate investigation and now onto the trial like I said at the start this trial was something that gripped the nation it was a sensation it was huge People were obsessed. It was like juicy chismis, man. Like they were into it. And for weeks, people were glued to this trial. People in court, you know, looked on in shock as 15-year-old Billy is sitting there like sobbing his eyes out, talking about what he did, describing exactly how he, you know, killed Greg Smart. He looked like a little boy, you know, because well, he was a little boy, who was so lost because of what he had done. He described how Pamela had told him what to do and how he would have never done what he did if Pamela didn't tell him to do it. That if, you know, Pamela didn't tell him, you know, you'll never see me again. And if you don't kill Greg, he would never have done any of that, that he was fully influenced by Pamela. Billy stated that on May 1st, 1990, Billy and Pete entered Pamela and Greg's home. And when they saw Greg there, they forced him down onto his knees. Pete held a knife to Greg's throat and Billy held a 38 caliber gun to Greg's head. Billy talked about how Greg was begging and pleading for his life. He was crying and he refused to hand over his wedding ring. Billy says he then pointed the gun at Greg's head. He said, God forgive me. And then he shot the gun. Now at the trial, Pam was petite. She was well-dressed and she was often referred to as a school teacher when she wasn't a school teacher. And Pam believes that this mistake fed into the stereotype of like a teacher student sexual relationship. And Pam's supporters, those who believe that she's innocent state that the media focused too much on Pam's appearance at the trial. And she wore these like bows in her hair, kind of like these clips, but they were bows. And that became like, a, like an object of fascination for a lot of people. And you know, it was a Pamela Smart bow. On top of that, Pam's demeanor at the trial, I think that also played into people, people claiming that she was this ice princess. She shed no tears at the trial, but you know, this kid, Billy, he's sitting there crying his eyes out, this 15 year old boy, 16 year old boy. And Pam's defense for this, she says that, you know, she was raised to contain her emotions. Like, she wasn't someone who would just cry like that openly. She says after the trial ended, every single night is when she would break down. The crazy thing is that Pamela's co-conspirators, they all secured like their deals prior to the trial even starting. And Pamela was portrayed as like this black widow who seduced this young boy into committing a murder. You know, she threatened to stop having sex with him unless, she, unless he killed her husband. Like that's the portrayal of Pamela. Billy and his friends were portrayed at like, as like these young naive boys who didn't know what they were doing. Whereas Pamela was seen as this cold hearted seductress, but her behavior also didn't help her case in a way. She was so unemotionless and a lot of it was down to apparently her being on antidepressants, but you know, people took it as her just being cold and unfeeling. They basically used the idea that Pamela was this older woman, this seductress who used her sexual being, you know, to seduce a boy into killing her husband. They painted Billy as being a virgin and Pamela, you know, had taken his virginity. But it was later found out that Billy was not a virgin. But I mean, it doesn't make a difference in the situation. That has nothing to do with whether he's a virgin or not. She was wrong in sleeping with him. And they also keep painting out Billy and Pam's relationship as an affair. And guys, it's not an affair. It's not. Pam was wrong, 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 wrong. So was Billy, but she's the adult technically. And I know she's still young, but she's the wrong one. Pam said she never told Billy to kill her husband, that Billy had misconstrued everything the wrong way. But the prosecution also said that Greg's $140,000 life insurance policy was also her motive. And that's how the trial proceeded. And those were the two sides. On March 22nd, 1991, 
Pamela Smart was found guilty of being an accomplice to first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, tampering with a witness, and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. There was actually a movie called To Die For, which was based off like a book written by this author, Joyce Maynard. And Joyce, she possibly regrets even writing this book because she is now one of a few other high profile women who um, are actually campaigning for the release of Pamela Smart. And I don't know why they don't believe she's guilty, but they're trying to get her free. And Pam actually watched this film in prison and she was like it's like a car accident that you can't stop looking at like people are just going to believe everything they see on tv as the truth both billy and pete were sentenced to 40 years in prison after pleading guilty to second degree murder and after serving like 25 years they were granted parole in 2015 jr who you know took his dad's gun and actually drove the getaway car he got like 10 or 15 years in prison and he was paroled in 2005 so now billy looking back he while he was in jail or prison he was a model prisoner he worked as an electrician and he did a lot of voluntary work in charities he did try to get his sentence reduced and he really did apologize to greg's family for what he had done but the reduction was denied but still he served 25 years for murder but he did marry his wife while he was still in prison and they are still together and they both currently live in Maine and Billy refuses to speak to the press about anything. Like he just wants to live his life and move on. Now, a lot of people who are mad at Pam state that she basically blamed everyone else and like, I didn't do it and Billy did it and this and that and it's everyone else's fault. She didn't take any responsibility for any of this at all. She later did make a statement to Greg's family, which said, I offer no excuses for my actions and behavior. I am to blame. I regret that it took me so long to apologize to the Smart family, my own family, and everyone else, but I think that I wasn't at a place where I was willing to own that or face that. I was young and selfish, and I wasn't thinking about the consequences of what I was doing. Now, even though she made the statement, Pam still claims her innocence till this day. Now at 54 years old, she has been at Bedford's uh, Women's Correctional Facility since 1993. She spent more than half her life in prison now. And she is the only one who was convicted of this murder who is still currently in prison. There is a lot of controversy regarding that. So what do you guys think? I mean, Pam and Billy's relationship from the get-go, wrong, 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 wrong. Some people feel that Pamela's sentence is so harsh that she should be released from prison already and others believe that she was completely innocent they believed you know her version of events and billy just acted on his own out of like you know he was a child and he was trying to like get his own way but the thing is why would those boys risk it all for nothing like billy yes he had the relationship with pam right but why would his friends join in just to help billy have sex you know what I mean? Like there must have been something promised to them. Yes, $500 isn't a lot, but kids are dumb. And maybe back then $500 was a lot. I mean, it kind of makes sense that Billy didn't want to lose Pam and, you know, him being younger than her. And if she did convince him to commit the murder, maybe she convinced him like, you're not going to get in that much trouble. Like no one will find out. Maybe she, she was able to convince him that what he was doing, he could get away with, you know, a robbery gone wrong. No one's going to suspect anything, but at 15, 16, I don't feel like you're that stupid, but I also feel like you could be pretty stupid and believe it. There's so many articles and videos online about people being for Pamela, against Pamela. You know, it's like, it's so divided and she's given so many interviews till date, but I feel like she should, I mean, if she was involved, just admit it already and kind of like just apologize for what you did. You're already in jail for life. Like, she has still never admitted it. She could say she was young and dumb and she didn't really understand her actions, you know, because 22 is not, you, you're not a genius at 22. Like you still don't have any life experience. Maybe she didn't realize Billy would actually do it. Maybe she, you know, was just talking trash. She was mad at Greg, Greg one day and she was just saying this to Billy and then he did it, you know, like I feel like there were so many different explanations she could have come up with but maybe the evidence was just too strong against her. In my opinion, I feel like her sentence is very harsh given that she didn't commit the actual murder. Like there are so many cases like this, right? Like murder for higher plots, but they don't get worse sentences than the people who committed it. She does deserve to be punished, but I think she also deserves a chance at life. 
if she didn't pull the trigger. I wonder why they got let off. I mean, like, even though Billy was the one that actually killed him, I mean, you know, it's is it because they were young? I don't believe also Pete should have gotten that much. Oh, I mean, okay, probably because he's the one that was there during the killing, right? Pam was only six years older than Billy. Like, it's not that much older and I'm not defending her. I'm just saying like, it just seems crazy. Like life without parole, like she was 22. She's probably going to be in jail for like 60 something years, maybe even more. Like, it's crazy. Let me know your thoughts on today's case, guys. What do you think about this crazy case? Do you think Pamela deserves her sentence? Do you think Billy should have been let out? Do you think any of the boys should have been let out? Do you think, what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you so much for all your support. I love you guys so much. And I will see you in the next video. Besitos. Bye.